Hello, uh, I'm Tim Murray coming to you from Ithaca, New York and Cornell University. Um, it's really tremendously thrilling for me to be able to address this gathering to celebrate the work of electronic disturbance theater and especially um, as it's located at the Centre de Culture Digital. Um, this is an institution I've long wanted to visit ever since my dear friend Grace Cantania founded it so many years ago. And since so much of this event and exhibition carries a spirit and imprint of, of grace, um, I hope you'll indulge me if I spend a few minutes positioning this talk around Grace's formidable legacy. For me, this goes back to 1998 when I was preparing a Cornell University exhibition on digital art, Contact Zones, the Art of CD-ROM. Initially intending to stage a very modest show that would introduce my Cornell University colleagues to five to six CD-ROMs created by artist friends in Australia, I acted on a whim and sent out a call for last minute entries on the brand new listserv Rhizome, really having no idea what this might mean and with no greater expectation that this listserv might generate a handful of additional works I was astounded to receive within three weeks, a three week deadline over 120 individual packages of CD-ROMs from around the world. The result was an exhibition of some 80 works from 21 countries, an astounding result on the eve of curating via the internet. Among these works were two intriguing pieces from young emerging digital artists from Mexico, Grace Cantania, and D.R. Isaias Mekix Otega. Subterranean by Isaias Otega provided a virtual reality pan of the subterranean tunnels of Mexico's subways in order to dwell on the passage of everyday life and its inherent loneliness in the digital age. In contrast, I received a more structurally complex piece from a young Grace Cantania. This piece, vice versa, upended the linear conventions of documentary film by delighting users with interactive movements between the past and present of her aunt and uncle, Beto and Cello Cobo, a burlesque dancer and a famous actor, perhaps best known for his youthful role in Bunuel's Los Ovidados. Breaking all conventions, vice versa crosses the boundaries a family photo album to explore a multimedia phantasmagoria of sound and performance, as well as the youthfulness and aging which Grace foregrounded with novel and experimental forms of digital morphing. Indeed, I believe that Grace was one of the first international artists to capitalize on digital effects to dwell on and celebrate the process of aging. That was well before the arrival of aging studies became prominent in North and South American cultural studies. Both pieces by Cantania and Ortega foregrounded the perils and promises of digital art in an evolving culture as digitality either could extend the alienating loneliness that Ortega associated with travel for daily labor or paradoxically transport users along with Cantania into fantastical celebrations of contemporary family and historical life. Of course, further explorations of mem memory and the feminine body captured Grace's artistic attention from there on, as she worked tirelessly at the same time to establish a center for digital culture that might empower the youth and enliven everyday experience in Mexico. Uh, my connection with Grace didn't end with the exhibition of her art in Ithaca, New York. Following the three month run of contact zones at Cornell, I took another stab at the Rhizome listserv by offering to travel the show. Then I was delighted to receive an almost immediate response in the middle of the night from a young and ambitious curator named Priamo Lozada, who then was working for Kanye Colta before becoming curatorial director of the new contemporary art space Laboratorio Arte Alameda. As many of you may realize, Priamo also left us far too early when he died in 2007 at the age of 43 in Venice as a result of a tragic accident 
soon after he finished installing the Mexican Pavilion, featuring the work of Rafael Lozana Hammer. But back to contact zones in Mexico City. Priamo had heard about the exhibition from Grace and was eager to bring it to the Centro de la Imagen. <coughs> In four hurried weeks, we rode the dazzling emergent energy of internet communication to translate the online English electronic catalog into Spanish, probably the first bilingual catalog on the emergent scene of the internet, and most likely also the first digital catalog of the Mexican exhibition. Priamo also simultaneously produced a printed catalog in Mexico. And then we installed Zonas de Contacto on 14 computers in the Centre de la Mahen's brand new Room of the Sky, which was the first public digital reading room in Mexico. Um, I have to add that I'll never forget the significant experience of installing this show in the midst of a 6.3 earthquake. Throughout that summer after that, visitors waited in line for a chance to experience digital art on one of the computers. And I might add that Priamo's many obituaries at the time of his death remembered his work at Laboratorio Arte Alameda and his curating <clears throat> of the 2002 Vidarte Festival, but unfortunately did not recognize his earlier and truly pioneering contribution to Mexican digital art in producing Zonas de Contacto. Indeed, the synergy of Priamo and Grace and their small band of experimental friends in the late 1990s um, in video and digital art set the stage for subsequent public programming in digital art and culture across Mexico. Now, after opening the Centro de Cultura Digital, Grace selflessly worked with me numerous times in Ithaca and Buenos Aires to promote her experiments with public digital culture in Mexico from donating sets of video produced at the center by Mexican youth to the Rhodes Schools and Archive of New Media Art, which I still curate at Cornell. Then six months later, Grace altered her schedule to join me at an international meeting in Buenos Aires with directors of international humanities centers and institutes, where we both urged traditional specialists in the humanities to integrate the democratic promise of digital culture into their intellectual projects and public programming. Grace was simply uncompromising in her mission. Her infectious smile and warm embrace welcomed collaborators as she consistently positioned digital art and culture at the forefront of progressive thought across the globe. And at the center of her passion was the institutional love of her life, the Centre de Culture, Culture Digitale. It is not fortuitous that Priyama Lozada's spirit also is linked indirectly to this exhibition of electronic disturbance theater. Priyama was passionate about the underappreciated legacy of Mexican digital art and culture that is grounded in the pioneering political manipulation of the internet by the Zapatistas. Indeed, in a spirited lecture he gave at Cornell soon before his passing, Priyama positioned Lozano Hemmer's famed night interactive performance on Zocalo Square, Victorial Elevation, in the context of the colonial resettling and remapping of indigenous space. You might recall that Victorial Elevation was designed for the millennial celebration of 2000. On the eve of the predicted crash of the digital interface, Lozano Hammer positioned 18 searchlights across the square that could be controlled and repositioned by internet users via an online 3D visual simulation program. Priamo further contextualized the irony of Lozano Hammer's digital resettling of Zocalo Square in relation to the Zapatista's prior response to the violence of settler colonialism through their partnering in electronic disobedience with the electronic disturbance theater. So this is the complex web woven together and separately by Priamo and Grace to activate digital art as a forceful means of social and cultural reflections, political activism and togetherness in Mexico. How very sad that I now can't return to Mexico City to celebrate the legacy of electronic disturbance theater in the empowering space crafted by the Prussian artist and curator, Grace Cantanilla. 
Permit me now to return again via the past by imagining the intersecting simulation of two other legacy events. First, an American teenage performer of Mexican blood walks the exit of a big box store in Florida by building improvisational sidewalk assemblages of tiny objects with the aim of seducing the baffled shoppers leaving the store to reflect on the commodity system enveloping them. Second, imagine group readings of poetry, philosophy, and theory in the comfort of a Florida feminist bookshop in, 19, in the 1980s that propelled a youthful collective toward the radical practice of artistic gesture, one leading to the disturbance of territories of power through the activation of public discourse and digital screens. The components of four decades of critical simulation thereby erupts. Performance meets activism, tactical art meets the public, and poetry flows from art and theory. These intersecting interventions of a young group of critical thinkers burst the electronic disobedience of the reading group, soon to be known as Critical Art Ensemble, CAE. A member of CAE is later entranced by the cyber poetic dreams of the digital Zapatistas, which leads to the charismatic history of electronic disturbance theater, otherwise known as EDT. Energizing the nuclear imaginary of four decades of collective electronic disobedience is that same youthful performance from Florida, Ricardo Dominguez. His later interventions with electronic disturbance 2.0 continue to trouble and remix narratives of data bodies, virtual capitalism, and networked embodiment. A particular note is the artist's prescient critical inquiry into technological interventions that bear on the politics of culture. His group's concomitant development of artistic tools enable a forceful phantasmatic response to the corporate clawbacks of flow and the sovereign subversions of network. Now let's first acknowledge the import of Dominguez's fruitful participation in critical art ensemble. Since 1992, this collective has explored the intersections of art, technology, critical theory, and radical politics. A proponent of tactical media actions, CAE has sought to engage particular social political contexts from tools to media in order to energize molecular interventions and semiotic shocks for the disruption of authoritarian culture. Their projects have ranged from the 1992 critique of the lack of access to US healthcare, the therapeutic state, which was distributed in hard and virtual form, to the parodic 1994 newspaper insert and website, Useless Technology. This critiques the socio-political distraction of the allure of new tools from say the Sony Hi-Fi stereo VCR with VCR plus programming to the MK21 advanced ballistic missile re-entry vehicle. Since 1997, CAE has been collaborating with Faith Wilding of Sub Rosa, Paul Vanaus, Beatriz da Costa, and others on improvisational interventions on biotechnology, from the genomic performance of the cult of New Eve to molecular invasion science theater workshop, whose aim was to reverse engineer genetically modified crops. Now, many specialists in digital art believe that the proof of the cultural threat of CAE's interventions came when its founder, Steve Kurtz, was arrested in May 2004 by US Homeland Security agents on charges of bioterrorism. This followed a bizarre sequence of events that began when Steve called emergency services to his home in the middle of the night after waking up to find his wife, Hope, lying lifeless next to him in bed. In the paranoid heat of the post 9-11 environment, medics entered the home to discover a small home bio lab, which so raised their suspicions that they summoned the FBI and the militarized forces 
of homeland security. As a means of preparing an art installation for the Massachusetts Museum of Contemporary Art, Mass MoCA, the Kurtz has set up a small home lab with biological equipment and Petri dishes containing biological specimens. At the time, they were experimenting at home with biomatter and genetically modified crops in preparation for their Mass MoCA show. Regardless of Steve's standing as an art professor at the University of Buffalo and his explanation that his was an art project, the FBI confiscated Hope's body, detained Steve for 22 hours without charge on suspicion of bioterrorism. The result was then a failed but vicious three-year governmental prosecution of Kurtz initially for bioterrorism as defined by the Patriot Act and later when the first charge did not stick for mail fraud for sending viral microorganisms. That was the kind of E. coli bacteria used in all high school labs through the US mail from a lab in the biology department at Carnegie Mellon Institute. At no time in recent American artistic politics has the improvisation of techniques been perceived by the authorities as being so threatening or itself been so under threat. In CAE's article, Not So Quiet on the Western Front, report on risk and cultural resistance within the neoliberal society of fear, the collective articulates the goal of its political approach in terms of the artistic performance of utopian ideals that can never be fully realized. The goal of their artistic conventions, they write, is to challenge and rearrange the symbolic order with the hope that the effects of the action may continue into the material order, creating further rearrangement of power relations. From interactive performance to video and net art, the activist techniques of CAE work to disturb the hegemony of biopolitical digital networks by staging the very touch of the unsettling discourse erupting from within the depressing assumptions about the closures of biopolitics. Consider the symbolic status of Michel Foucault's <clears throat> exemplary figure of the rise of the biopolitical, the touch of the invisible hand imagined by the philosopher economist Adam Smith. Within the current context of a society of control, this would be understood as the invisibly guiding hand with which beneficent neoliberal corporations promote the common good of the digital frontier to and for those whose personal data and purchasing power will sustain and benefit the very system that envelops and exploits them. In adopting the figure of the invisible hand as the logo of the birth of biopolitics, Foucault writes that invisibility is not just a fact arising from the imperfect nature of human intelligence, which prevents people from realizing that there is a hand behind them which rearranges or connects everything that each individual does on their own account. Invisibility, he continues, is absolutely indispensable. It is an invisibility, which means that no economic agent should or can pursue the collective good. As Dominguez so aptly summarizes CAE's writings and actions, they comprise radical gestures that cut against the grain of invisibility in the cultural terrain. Referencing the theater of poverty of Augusto Boal, Dominguez emphasizes the power of the group's micro gestures that help to define territories of power in relation to simulations of public space. The result at the end of the 1980s were cultural vaccine projects related to AIDS activism through ACT UP Tallahassee. Imagine how this early CAE action against a virus compelled an entire international generation of artists to come of age early and abruptly when they avoided the tragedy of premature death. Now, wouldn't these kinds of viral interventions by ju be just as impactful today as we face excessive global inequities of access to and acceptance of vaccines to combat COVID-19? So just as queer and color communities suffered disproportionately from lack of access to AIDS treatment in the late 1980s, 
similarly disenfranchised communities from indigenous populations across North, Central, and South America to impoverished communities across the globe have been suffering now, today, as wealthier populations claim first access to COVID vaccines and more sophisticated approaches to treatment. But let's probe further CAE's long critical fixation on rearranging the symbolic order per se in a way that might indirectly reinvigorate the notion of a volcanic center. Even when rendered visible, might not micro gestures that expose the territories of power be insufficient for responding to the expansive risks of the military industrial complex as it morphs speedily across the neoliberal network? Perhaps something of a poetic rewriting or a poetic rewiring of the field of play would be beneficial. Something of a fictionalization of critical fields whose morphine improvisations of perception might skirt through performance the symbolic parameters of the big daddy mainframe. Might we not be empowered to reimagine through play and fiction how the symptoms and dangers of biopolitics, climate change, and militaristic incursion have already impinged on our material comfort in the future? So how to rewire or repurpose the multiple social, corporate, and militaristic viruses that so comprise our social code. Ricardo Dominguez has suggested that one response lies in what he calls the performative matrix that he and his artistic comrades articulated in the early 1990s as comprising the relation between databases and real bodies or between virtual capitalism and data body entrapments. It is no secret that CAE's manifestos, electronic disturbance and electronic civil di disobedience set the stage for a broad international network of activist hackers who have turned to digital culture and the internet as an open site for tactical media actions of political resistance. Since parting ways with CAE, the electronic disturbance theater led by Ricardo Dominguez, who also co-authored the CAE manifestos, turned progressively to the conceptualization and practice of cyber poetics. Cyber poetics is a way to reshape and redefine the disempowering invisibilities of cyber terrorism. This led initially to Ricardo's experimentation with Jordan Crandall to devise the digital drama of Blast 5 an online multimedia journal in the early days of the lo-fi modem. Here, low res means, here the low res means of communicating took, as Ricardo saw it, simulation beyond simulation as the slow speed of downloading deadened, he says, whatever was liberating in the way of capital. Here in the wake of what I used to call the digital pause, Last five infused the impetus of critical action since the paradox of slow download speed enlivened the user imaginary that worked at hyperspeed. Dominguez then soon came to acknowledge the additional impact on his artistic practice of the Zapatista's mobilization of cyber activism, which he says moves at the speed of dreams instead of the speed of the network. Their terms, networks of struggle, and networks of resistance were foundational to his embrace of what he calls the digital zapatismo of the electronic disturbance theater 1.0. From there on, EDT ascribed the force of indigenous futurism, which meant doing something other. EDT then launched the benchmark flood net actions against the Me Mexican govern government's repression of the zapatistas relying on its development of software that more easily floods or attacks government sites with repetitive unwanted internet hits, EDT has organized since 1998 a series of mass decentered electronic actions on behalf of the Zapatistas whose virtual blockades and virtual sit-ins have temporarily choked the sites of Mexican financial institutions, the Mexican embassy in the UK, and Mexican President Zidia's personal website. 
Since then, EDT has challenged the notion that the internet should be protected only as a site for state-sponsored corporate communication by insisting that it should be nurtured as a transparent cyber poetic system, a transparent cyber poetic system. Cyber poetics, so crucial to EDT's core, enables an active nonviolent space for open networks and the virtual embrace of open spaces of indigenous societies. For EDT, this lends itself to a nonviolent act of politics. The theoretician Erin Manning could be describing the engagement of EDT when she describes a politics of touch as an erring toward an other through which the body resists the state. The political guest use of touch and its inherent critique of state violence, she adds, does not seek to uphold the law or the symbolic order, but to creatively propel contradictory, re contradictory readings of juxtaposition and relation. Since then, the global art and theoretical works here considered from two decades of EDT performances call back to the reverse engineering of two interrelated discourses in the theoretical study of media. Tactical media, on the one hand, and philosophies of touch and technology on the other, both of which I discussed throughout my book forthcoming in February from the University of Minnesota Press, Technics Improvised, Activating Touch in Global Media Art. Tactical media has become something of a household term in media studies ever since Rita Rayleigh championed it as the title of her 2009 book. In her pioneering study of border hackings, virtual war, and speculative capital, which dedicates a section to EDT, Rayleigh foregrounds the work of politically oriented artists whose media works shift from strategy to tactics in a way that, she says, renders the phenomenon of resistance fleeting, ephemeral, and subject to continual morphing. What most importantly aligns Rayleigh's approach with EDT in my readings uh, in Technics Improvised is not only the tactical motivation of projects by EDT and its digital zapatismo, but also her insistence on how the critical operation of her book makes visible, stabilizes, and even concretizes, she says, a set of projects for which ephemerality and mutability are not only part of the epistemology of the work, but also a means of functioning. So the uncertain prospects of epistemology and its related performances of cyber poetics cast the most viable category of knowing and functioning within the social conditions of risk, as well as within the temporal mutability of media's uncertainty in the future. This emphasis on epistemology as improvisation questions the bounded ontology of objects, settler colonialism, and corporations, medialized or not, by endorsing a tactical approach to orientation and knowledge that permits the torque of temporary improvisation and reverse engineering to continually unsettle symbolic preoccupations. Skeptical of the political valence of the symbolic and its real, even in the most eco-critical and material guises, EDT can be said to have continually remediated knowledge itself via its performative blends of art and activist thought. EDT thus emphasizes the critical and improvisational payoff of openness to fictionality and virtuality as opposed to the potential closures of ontology and objecthood is a means of screening the challenges, personal and political, of the uncertain threats of futurity. It is within the context, this context, that I reemphasize the importance to Ricardo Dominguez and experimental disturbance theater of the openness of indigenous futurism, which entails the doing of something other. The threat of doing something other to the logic of corporate governmental power again became evident in the 2010 investigation and prosecution of Dominguez for projects undertaken by EDT 2.0, which
which Ricardo established in his B-A-N-G, Bang Lab, after he began, became a faculty member in the Department of Art at the University of California, San Diego. Two interrelated actions made Dominguez as a scapegoat figure of EDT 2.0, the subject of university and federal investigations. On March 4th, 2010, the day of a statewide student strike in protest of massive funding cuts and tuition increases at the University of California, on that day, <clears throat> a UC Irvine affiliate of Bang Lab relied on the lab's infrastructural support to launch a virtual sit-in on the website of the Office of the President of the University of California. Um, for context, I'll clarify that the University of California at San Diego is one of 10 campuses of the broader University of California system, such as Berkeley, UCLA, et cetera. While each campus is overseen by a chancellor, the system as, as a whole is managed by a president. Now, one consequence of the virtual sit-in was that Dominguez and his lab were subsequently investigated for engaging in a felonious, felonious DDOT, distributed denial of service attack. Related was the investigation of an affiliate member of EDT for launching the website markudoff.com, which fiction, fictitious, fictitiously declared the resignation of said Mark Udoff who was chancellor of the University of California. These investigations constituted a significant departure from legal precedent since a virtual sit-in had previously been understood in the US to constitute an expression of free political speech, which would normally protect its actors from prosecution. The gravity of these investigations happening across university, state, federal jurisdictions could well have stemmed from Bang Lab's highly publicized and officially funded project, the Transborder Immigrant Tool, Mexico US Border Disturbance Art Project, otherwise known as TBT. Embodying the virtual reach of the digital Zapatismo, this artistic project developed an app designed for low budget Motorola 1455 cell phones that includes poetic sound files and a navigational program. Its creative application of the technologies of spatial data systems and GPS orients immigrant travelers to safe routes and water drops across the US border while enabling a new relationship with the landscape via applications for simulation, surveillance, resource allocation, management of cooperative networks, and pre-movement pattern model modeling, such as the vir virtual hiker algorithm that maps out a potential or suggested trails for real hikers to follow. At the core of this fictional project is the artist's aim to interject into the border an eco-poetic disturbance of archival dispute. As EDT understands the history of the border dispute between Mexico and the US, what results is a digital tracking of motion and movement. The border between the US and Mexico, EDT writes, is moved between the virtual and the all too real since before the birth of two, the two nation states. This has allowed a deep archive of suspect movement across this border to be traced and tagged, specifically anchored to immigrants' bodies moving north while immigrant bodies moving south, much less so. Following the logic of Edouard Glissant's linkage of peoples through the accumulation of sediments and Arjun Aparadai's appropriation of networked imagination and fantasy for social engagement through archival aspiration, TBT adds, in its words, a new layer of agency to this emerging virtual geography it would allow segments of global society that are usually outside of this emerging grid of hyper geo mapping power to gain quick and simple access to empowering GPS systems. TBT would not only offer access to potential immigrants traveling across the border to this emerging, emerging total map economy, 
but an intelligent agent algorithm that would parse out the best routes and trails on that day and hour for immigrants to cross this vertiginous landscape as safely as possible. Dance curator Ashley Farrow Murray lauds this intervention as exemplary of what she calls tactical choreography, thus taking us back to Dominguez's youthful obsession with the micro gestures of critical art ensemble. Farrow Murray celebrates how TBT shifts the poetics of the borderlands desert from state imposed stillness to sustainable movements. The desert survival of information that is central to the TBT code, she writes, commits the project to a technologically administered choreography moored in radical motion through space and time. So hearkening back to Dominguez's youthful performances in Florida, under suspicion then was EDT's improvisation of imaginative gestus in movement and in space for the sake of reimagining social structures while resisting the oppressive reliance on digital tools for state corporate operations of authority and power. Digital Zapatismo rides again. Now, what was really strange about the hyperbolic media resistance to this project was its articulation of opposition, not to the artistic appropriations of technology, but to the very poesis itself inherent in TBT. Included in TBT are poetic interventions composed by Amy Sarah Carroll that welcome the immigrant users to the promises of the new land. This is what truly crossed the line in the cynical opinion of Fox News commentator Glenn Beck. As the illegals he writes, are trudging 80 miles across the desert, at least they'll have the welcoming hospitality of the Statue of Liberty giving them poetry. Who needs water when their souls will be refreshed in life refreshing dew of poetry? Now the snide tone of Beck's delivery ironically seems to mime the performative energetics of such a poetic contribution to the struggle of improvisation. As Dominguez sees it, technic improvisations of poesis do, do indeed lie at the heart of EDT. All the members of EDT 2.0 bang anchor their being and becoming as artists and every gesture that we make as an aesthetic gesture. And for us, the frame of our work can be traced as an aesthetics of code switching between the Greek etymology of the work as aesthetic, that which is perceptive by feeling, and the effective poetry of code that functions, that works. Thus, he concludes, we are constantly and concurrently affective and effective. Code switching, the interweave of poetics and networked action thus constitutes the enlivening technical aesthetics of electronic disturbance theater. What's more, the effective micro gestures of digital zapatismo continue to drive EDT's collaborative poetics of autonomy, reflexivity, and critical simulation. Always inhabiting the horizon of the near future, its artivism now quakes the performative matrices of clone capitalism, synthetic biology, and nano-driven technology. EDT is imperative of doing something other, embodies its co-creative attunement of indigenous futurism. But what we might ask, what about indigenous futurism now? 10 years later. In blending art, theory, and social action, electronic disturbance theater has strategically combined artistic and theoretical improvisation to foreground and counter the extent to which media art remains at risk, not just from the quarantine of a global pandemic, 
but from the very viral and material conditions of technology itself. From the outset, EDT has questioned how global media art, from video to networked to performance, sp speaks back to the corporate closures of digital euphoria as clothed in strategies of network surveillance, planned obsolescence, and ecological deprivation. At stake have been the shifting dynamics that happen when the archival meets the phantasmatic, when the singularity of the artistic object blends into the plurality of the global artistic event, and when artistic practice and theory respond to the urgent interdisciplinary improvisations of digital culture and political thought. These are the improvisations of thinking techniques today that EDT understands to be artistically affirmational in contrast to the anesthetizing skepticism of those who clothe the allure of new media only in the threatening symbolic of digital neoliberal capital. Only to return to my opening remarks on critical ensemble to symbolism. In an effort to reflect on the shifting knowledge structures of global art practices threatened by technological and biopolitical frameworks, EDT explores the cultural transformation of art's poetic activist touch. We can now appreciate how creatively and forcefully artistic and theoretical practices seize on the improvisational accidents of techniques to activate creativity, thought, and politics anew. At stake still remains, now in retrospect, the continual raising of the political question of media technology, while EDT churns its potential from within. Now to Dominguez, a grand challenge is now arises today with the emergence of autonomous technologies, not only the cell phones of TBT and the drones of global warfare, but also new scales of unmanned technologies such as clone and particle capitalism, synthetic biology, and nano-driven technology. In asking, what is artivism now? Dominguez wonders how networks mobilize embodiment beyond the screen interface. One approach was taken in 2008 by the joint exhibition Specflix 2.6 by UC San Diego artists Adrian Jenick and Particle Group an art collective consisting of Ricardo Dominguez, Diane Luden, Nina Weissman, and Amy C Sarah Carroll. Their art installations ask the viewer to consider a not so distant future in which individuals will be intimately connected to networks, not only through our computers, but also via nanoparticles in or on our own bodies. Included for instance, are a series of nanoparticle videos displayed via the portable miniaturized screens of the iPod. Interestingly, Particle Group returns to posing the same kinds of epistemological challenges with which Dominguez began as a youthful theorizer in Florida. As artists and activists, they write, we are not trying to shift, we are not trying to shift the process of scientific production, but to ask, what is not being tested and why? And how are the processes being narrated? In our case, why is nanotoxicology receiving so little funding on a national and global scale? Why are so many everyday project, products ranging from cosmetics to tennis balls being brought to market with little to no long-term testing of their effects on the human body? Now, it's almost as if Dominguez has returned full circle to the earlier performative matrix of critical art ensemble relating the virtual database and real bodies. Dominguez similarly returned to his youthful commitment to tactical micro gestures, aligning territories of power with simulations of public space. His Drones at Home project, for instance, expands on the unknown nature of the drone is symbolic of a larger condition. Ecologies where the status he rights of the human is called into question, distributed and embedded in a wider field of shared intelligence. 
Responding to the increasing militarization of drone technology for warfare and policing and biogenetics, Dominguez joined with the UC San Diego colleagues, Ian Allen Paul and Jane Stevens to form the fictional UC Center for Drone Policy and Ethics. This center portended to have been founded by the UC Office of the President. Uh, Ricardo just wouldn't give up on rattling the cage of the UC president. Their announced aim of the center was to explore the emerging implications of drone research use and production within the UC system. Their penultimate achievement was a masterful virtual performance of a drone crash incident on the UC San Diego campus. A combination of disturbance theater and critical fiction and imagery, the incident occurred over the course of a week-long distribution of press releases about the fictional drone crash, university forums, a website, and a public town hall to discuss the perpetrated crash with students, faculty, and the public. What's particularly striking about this action, similar to that of TBT, is that the greater and more transparent the simulation, the deeper the impact, here even resulting in an official denial by the university press office and by extensive press coverage of the crash itself, later revealed as a new media art project. So doesn't this just epitomize the poetic performances of Ricardo Dominguez and his inventive band of code switchers. In blending art theory and curatorial practice, Dominguez and EDT have staged strategic combinations of artistic and theoretical improvisation to foreground and counter the extent, the extent to which media art remains at risk. It can't be overstated again how from the outset their work is questioned, how global media art from video to networked performance does speak back to the cultural, to the corporate closures of digital euphoria as closed in the strategies of, as we've said, network surveillance, planned obsolescence and social deprivation. To conclude, I would like to return to the activist context of the Centre de Cultura Digitale to consider one last drone project, this one by the inventive feminist Bolivian artist, Patricia Dominguez. Her single track video, Madre Drone, also almost serves as something of a prescient epilogue of the long durée of electronic disturbance theater. At the outset of Madre Drone, a colossal militarized robot faces a diminutive female drone whose green laser empowered fingers caress the robot trapped in my right side for immediate activation of the left. The same electrifying green laser later emits from the drone's fingers to stroke the dead fur of a burnt fox and to cuddle a toucan blinded by the fires of deforestation. Patricia Dominguez enacts a heroic eco-feminist effort to call nature back to life to the prior life of a teeming Bolivian rainforest burnt and singed by capitalist greed. As if disturbing the aesthetic calm of the historic videos of Bill Viola, this enigmatic animal eyes stare back curiously at the voyeuristic camera. Madre drone electrifies the touch of the eye. In tactical performance, the artist recombines shots of the one-eyed toucan with cosmological representations of the ocular wounds of 460 Santiago protesters assaulted during the same time period by the bullets, pellets, and tear gas of fascist Chilean police. In, Andi in Andean cosmology, says Patricia Dominguez, the eyes are situated on the back and we look toward the past. In neoliberal cosmology, cosmology it would seem that the eyes are the price we pay for being vulnerable. Eyes, our most precious possessions, are often the highest price we pay for our sacred relationships with the future. The system, she continued, has unleashed 
an assault on the gays. The internalized racism and classism of this country have set in motion the acceleration of the long overdue revolution. Now in assemblages from Bolivia and Chile, nature and its eco-feminist protectors, as if by the spirit of digital Zapatisto, ride the power of Madre drones to strike back through a montage of fictionalized electro touch and haunting footage of burning forests and searing protests. At the video's end, laser pointers of hundreds of protesters enlivened combined their celestial touch to burn to the ground a surveilling militarized drone. As a fitting concluding homage to the spirit of electronic disturbance theater, Madre Drone solicits those blinded birds and wounded protesters to activate, says Dominguez, this being Patricia, a new way of seeing, one that matters, one that will still permit us to experience the future. In a fitting transformation of ecotechnics, the drone mother's laser eyes seed at the conclusion of the video to the experience of the leaky fluids of tears pouring down drone mother's face, whose affective touch ends up wrapping the politics of activism back into communal embrace. As EDT says, we are both affective and effective. So by so combining the ecological activisms of human and nature, Madre Drone enacts what Verena Andermont Connolly <clears throat> calls an eco-feminist vision of how ecological thinking and action can be oriented toward the future rather than a nostalgic past. So think of this, orientation toward the future. Hasn't this been the performative position of Ricardo Dominguez throughout the empowering career of his electronic disturbance theater? Thank you. Gobierno de México.